Zechariah chapter number 12 tonight. Zechariah chapter number 12. Hope we'll finish verse number, uh, verse number 9 through 14 tonight, and we'll uh, move next week into chapter 13, where we're, we're uh, beginning to look at the revelation of Messiah. Second coming, the revelation, we're talking about the, when we say the revelation of Messiah, the re, his revelation to, of himself to uh, Israel, uh, who missed him the first time. Uh, they did not see him as being the Messiah, but they will see him when he comes again. Now, I want you to think about when God the Father, by his Holy Spirit, draws a person to his beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he opens their eyes and gives them grace to repent of their sin, uh, of unbelief, and, and believe on the one true Messiah for who he truly is, that is a wonderful, marvelous thing. Somebody gets saved in it. It just is. And no matter when it happens, it's, it's a wonderful, glorious thing. Now the Bible tells us that God's Holy Spirit is the one who convicts of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Jesus said that in John chapter number 16, verse number 8. The Holy Spirit leads poor lost sinners to Jesus. And their eyes are opened, and they are led out of their spiritual blindness to the spiritual light that is in Christ Jesus Himself. One of these days, though, according to the prophecy that we're going to be reading here tonight, given here to Zechariah, the entire nation of Israel, the entire nation, will experience this same conversion. As their blindness is removed and their eyes are opened by the Spirit of God, they will recognize Jesus as the Messiah and they will repent. And this will be a, a national conversion of the Jewish people. Something that's never happened before. Okay? National conversion. Apostle Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians 3.16 when he was talking about the, the uh, children of Israel, the people of Israel, by and large, have a veil over their heart. They, they won't come to know the Lord. He says in 2 Corinthians 3.16, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Speaking of that veil upon their heart that keeps them from seeing who He is. Now, the six verses of our text tonight describe how God will do this. Do I, do I know, know all the ins and outs? No. You know, I just believe what the Bible says. Uh, and uh, I believe that it's, it's going to be an amazing thing. These, these verses serve as strong evidence that God has not given up on His people. Let's read the verses, verses 9 through 14, and we'll come back and look at them individually. Uh, Zechariah 12, verse number 9, And it shall come to pass in that day uh, that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of Hadid Rimmon, in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, and the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart. All the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. Now we see in verses 9 and 10 what the turning point will be. The turning point will come in the midst of the Jews' greatest distress that we talked about last week. As we saw, all the nations will be determined against Israel, coming against them and attacking them. And that's what verse 9 is talking about. It shall come to pass in that day, the day 
when they, they are there, uh, here they are uh, being attacked. It said that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Now, the Lord's power of judgment will be demonstrated in His wrath uh, uh, toward the armies that are hostile towards Israel. But the power of God's grace is demonstrated in the salvation of the Jews. I mean, you got the judgment against the enemies. you got the grace to Israel. It will not be the outward distress of the great tribulation that will lead Israel to the inward turning point, but it will be accomplished by the inner working of the Holy Spirit. That's what verse 10 is talking about. And I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now, if God did not do this, Israel would never return to the Lord. Um, but God will do it and because He has promised to do it. Israel must recognize the Son of God, but this can only take place through the Spirit of God, the same way that you came to know the Son of God through the Spirit of God. Your heart was convicted uh, of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, and, and the Holy Spirit's got to do that in their hearts. When Christ celebrated the Last Supper, I want you to think about that. When He celebrated the Last Supper with His disciples, He introduced a new covenant, the, the New Testament, in His blood is what He called it. Listen to Matthew 26. Verse 27 through 29. It says, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now we read parallel passages also in Mark 14. I'm not going to turn to there. Mark 14 verses 23 to 25. Also in Luke 22 and verse 20. And then Paul reiterated it when he uh, wrote 1 Corinthians 11 25 that we use whenever we have the Lord's table. Now this covenant was founded on the work of redemption in Christ Jesus. Talking about the new covenant. Uh, it, was, it was founded upon the work of redemption in Christ Jesus, but it's, it's made effective through the Holy Spirit of God. Now, the Jewish people are being led toward the new covenant. I mean, they're already being called back into the land. Um, and this was, uh, this was even proclaimed by the prophets. And I do want you to turn to some of these passages. So let's look at, uh, hold your place here in Zechariah. But I want you to turn to uh, Ezekiel chapter number 11 first. And we're going to do, do a, another couple of places in, the, in Ezekiel. And then we'll uh, turn to another book. Uh, Ezekiel 11, verse 19 and 20. Uh, the Lord says, and He's looking toward the future, and He said, And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. Now look at chapter number 36. Chapter number 36 and verse number 20, 26 and 27 here. Verse number 26 and 27. And it says pretty much the same thing here. It says, a, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. Ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Look at chapter 37 there, and look at verse number 11 through 14 with me. In verse number 11, then said he, and this, this is the, uh, in the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, if you remember the, that prophecy. And uh, the, this, after he uh, 
prophesied here in verse number 11 that he said unto me, Son of man, these bones that are the whole house of Israel, behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I, well, I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Now look at, down in verse number 26 through to, uh, verse number 28. Verse number 26. He says here, he says, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will pl place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. I mean, that, that, is, that is truth, isn't it? Uh, we see uh, Romans, uh, Paul mentioned, look at Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 25 through 28 here. Romans 11 and verse number 25. It says here, says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. And by and large here, he's talking to Gentiles, a Gentile church here. He says, The blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion... Uh, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. And then one other place, Hebrews chapter number 8. Hebrews and chapter number 8. And look at verse number 7 through 13 here. Verse number 7. Hebrews 8 and verse number 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Talking about the, 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 the first covenant that the Lord made, the, the, the uh, Mosaic covenant, the law. He says, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, the new covenant he, he hath made the, the first old. Now, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So, uh, we know under the, the Old Covenant, which was founded on the law, given at Sinai, God said to them, God said to Israel, said in Exodus 19, verse 5, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then shall ye be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Well, we know that even in... Uh, uh, requiring them to follow the covenant and obey him. We, he knew that disobedience was going to take place. And so he made a provision for their sin to be covered. But they walked so far away from the covenant that they were not take, taking care of the sin in their life. There was no short accounts. They were sinning and sinning and sinning on top of sinning. And they got so far away from the Lord, the Lord had them carried away into captivity. 
Now under the new covenant, according to Hebrews 8, verse 10 and 12 that we just read, God says, I will. I will. He was looking for His people to do, but He's going to do work a work that they could not work. Under the old covenant, we know that obedience came out of fear, but uh, under the new covenant, uh, obedience comes from the, the Spirit who gives one a willing heart. The new covenant will produce mercy and grace in Israel as well as supplications, that word supplications that we read there in Zechariah 12 in verse number 10. Remember he said the spirit of grace and of supplications. That, uh, he's talking about graciousness and earnest prayer that uh, that grace is the kindness and favor. And of course, he, he does shower them with kindness and favor when he comes then. And, and uh, uh, the, the grace of the Holy Spirit will lead them to the crucified Savior. Zechariah 12, verse 10, there, uh, after he talks about the supplication, he says, They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. The people of the old covenant who have ignored Him for centuries uh, by purposely passing over uh, scriptures like Isaiah 53. You know, Isaiah 53 is a, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it looks forward to His crucifixion, His hanging on the cross. And they, they can figure out who this suffering servant was. You know? And the, the suffering servant came right in their midst. And other messianic, messianic passages um, they would skip over in their synagogues because they didn't, they didn't understand them. But they will be led to Calvary where salvation uh, was bought for them just as well as it was bought for us. Amen? What a, what a blessing. At Calvary, that which Moses pointed to prophetically in the wilderness, remember when he lifted up the brass serpent over in Numbers Chapter number 21, I'm not going to turn over there tonight to that passage of Scripture, but it talks about, uh, and we, I'll give, give you some details here in just a minute, but where he lifted that brass serpent up will become abundantly clear to them. Uh, but in Numbers 21, verses 7 through 9, we know that the Israelites had sinned grievously at that time, and they were impatient, and they spoke out against the Lord. They were good about speaking out against the Lord and speaking against God's man, Moses. Uh, they were quick to do that. And uh, they were complaining, and they were despising the food that uh, He provided for them. Well, the Lord had enough of it. And He sent, he, uh, he sent poisonous serpents, which bit many of the Israelites, causing them to die. And the Israelites were, began to see the, the tragedy and the results of their sins, and they cried out, We have sinned! That's what they cried out for. And Moses prayed to the Lord on behalf of his people, and the Lord instructed Moses to lift up a brass serpent. And everyone who had been bitten by a serpent could actually look at the, the brazen serpent that Moses had erected, and they could be saved. Well, uh, the Bible casts a prophetic light on the history of the Jews and Christ's first coming. Um, did they not become impatient with Christ? They did, didn't they? They were annoyed with Him and spoke out against Him. The Jews despised Him as the bread of life that God had sent. And the results were devastating. Many of the Jewish people died in the 70 A.D. as a result of that rejection of their Messiah and what, those that didn't die were scattered abroad. But Christ is at the same time the exalted serpent. In fact, He was made to be sin for us and purchase forgiveness and salvation for us. Now, brass in the Bible has to do with judgment. That's why it's a brazen serpent. It's the, it's the judgment there. And, of course, the serpent speaks of sin. He became sin for us. Okay? And so Christ referred Nicodemus, if you remember. He was talking to Nicodemus. He referred Nicodemus to that story in the Old Testament uh, according to uh, the Apostle John's Gospel in John chapter 3, in verse number 14 through 16. And I, and I read there, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have 
everlasting life. So uh, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a, a Jew that would know the account of Numbers, he, he would know that account of, uh, of uh, Moses raising that brazen serpent, uh, the, the Lord brought it to the forefront as what was going to happen in his life. Now, the remnant of Israel is being led toward this point that we see here in Zechariah 12. And Israel will look upon the cross of Calvary, acknowledging the one whom they pierced, and then and only then will they find their redemption. Now, the story of the crucifixion makes it clear uh, the fact that Christ died for the Jews and that they will partake in this uh, accomplished salvation. Look at uh, John's Gospel, chapter number 19. John's Gospel, chapter number 19 for a moment. And I think this is the last place I'm going to have you turn other than turning back to uh, our, our text. But in uh, the story of the crucifixion, it was, it was here uh, and we see... Uh, in John 19, look at verse number 33, and this is when the Lord's on the cross, and they come by to check uh, to see if he's dead, and if he wasn't dead, they were going to break his legs. Okay, look at verse 33, but when they came to Jesus, saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he saw that that and he, he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he he knoweth that he saith is true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Okay, a couple of scriptures here. One is a bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So Zechariah uh, looked forward to the cross. Saul, the, the, you know, he, he penned the, the words of the Lord there in Zechariah and looked forward to that time when Christ was on the cross and would be pierced. At that time, this a centuries-old prophecy was, um, was fulfilled, but they did not recognize it. The Jews did not see it. You know, they saw Him pierced, but they didn't, draw, they didn't draw the two together. Because God knew this already. The Holy Spirit referred to another text and testified of, of Israel's future. They shall look on me whom they pierce. And when the Lord returns, that will take place, which is described here in Zechariah 12 and verse number 10. Uh, listen, to, uh, listen to what John wrote in the book of Revelation, chapter number 1, verse number 7. Revelation 1 7, he said, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. So, uh, John had the opportunity to, to pin it not only in his gospel, uh, with the section talking about the Lord's crucifixion, but he wrote it there in the book of Revelation while he was on the Isle of Patmos. Now, uh, so we see the great turning point. With their backs against the wall, the Holy Spirit of God will turn their hearts toward the Messiah Savior. Now, second thing we want to see is we see Israel's recognition and mourning over the Son of God. And that's the, that's the second part of uh, uh, verse number 10. They shall look on me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only Son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now, understand that at their conversion, the Jews will not only recognize their Messiah, uh, the promised Redeemer, but the, 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 and the one that is also the crucified one, but they will also recognize him as the Son of God who became the Son of Man. And, and, and Jesus is that. He is the, he's the Son of God who became the Son of Man so that the sons of man can become the sons of God. Okay? Uh, it, it's uh, uh, the, the truth that's involved there. This means nothing more than that they will find Messiah to be true God and true man. 
and they will weep over him as one weeps over an only son. Now, Christ is the only begotten Son of God. We know that. Jesus Christ is also the true Son of Israel, the Messiah, who came through the Jewish people. Don't forget that Jesus was a Jew. Now, there's a lot of, a lot of folks uh, wanting to uh, uh, badmouth all Jews. Well, be careful. Don't badmouth the Savior. Uh, you ought not to be badmouthing the Jews anyway. But uh, Jesus was a Jew. Salvation came through the Jews. Uh, but they missed Him. By and large, they, I know there's some Jews that got saved, and there's still some Jews that get saved from time to time. But uh, uh, listen, by and large, as a nation, they missed out on the Messiah. When speaking about the raised serpent to, to Nicodemus, Christ connected the two, uh, the Son of God and the Son of Man. And In John 3.14, he spoke about the Son of Man who comes from the line of Israel. He says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And Jesus was the Son of Man. He was the Son of Man, but He was also the Son of God. And in John 3.16, He identifies this one as being the very Son of God who comes from heaven. When He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, Jesus Christ made it very clear that He is both Son of God and Son of Man. Amen? And Christ is the one of whom Daniel spoke in Daniel chapter number 7. I'm not going to ask you to you just write it down. I'm not going to ask you to turn there uh, because I told, told you I wasn't going to have you turn anywhere else. But Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. Daniel said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought Him near before Him. And there was given Him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. and His kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Now when Israel sees Him as the pierced one, as the one who hung upon the cross, she will recognize Him as both Son of God and Son of Man, and it will cause them to weep over Him and repent. The whole nation. I know it seems unbelievable, but that's what the, that's what the Bible says. Man, Israel will lament over Him as the one and only Son whom she lost. For, for she will see that God came to her in the person of Jesus Christ, but that she rejected Him at His first coming. This is the one we rejected. We should have, we should have accepted Him. Our, our, our forefathers should have accepted Him. Uh, but he will, he will show Himself. Amen. Um, third thing. We see the great national repentance of Israel in verses 11 through 14 that we read there. I know... Maybe it was a little bit confusing, but it was, in that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, and then that gets into some things here that we'll we'll talk about. But the uh, the recognition of who Messiah is will lead Israel to a deep repentance that she has never experienced in her entire history. Okay, um, we see there will be repentance and mourning in Jerusalem, verse eleven. Uh, Jesus, the Messiah, Israel's Lord, we know was crucified in Jerusalem. The people of Jerusalem uh, rejected Him. Uh, John 19, verse 14, says that they cried, Away with Him! Away with Him! Crucify Him! We have no king but Caesar. Now, Jesus illustrated their attitude in the parable that He told in Luke 19, verse 14, uh, it says, But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. He was telling that story to a group of Pharisees. Okay? And it was them that he was talking about. And when he got through telling that story, they kind of figured it out that, Hey, wait a minute. He's talking about us. And they, it didn't make them none too happy. Uh, Jesus illustrated, though, their attitude in that parable. 
Matthew records that they said in Matthew 27, verse 25, His blood be on us and on our children. Now the accounts of Christ's crucifixion tell how they mocked Him, they smoked their breasts, and then returned to their daily routines. So it was as business as usual. And that's why Jerusalem's repentance is mentioned first. It's compared here uh, to something that may not be uh, make sense right off. It's compared to Israel's lamenting in, uh, in uh, it's compared to Israel's uh, lamenting in Hadadrimmon in the valley of Megiddo. Now, that's referring to Jeremiah's lamentation when the God-fearing king Josiah was killed in the valley of Megiddo. If you want to read about that, I'll give you the, the, the passage of 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verses 20 through 25, 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 35, verse 20 through 25, and it said that, that it's that kind of lamentation, and that it, it would be a great mourning in Jerusalem as that mourning that happened there over the good King Josiah. Now, we see the repentance also of those in the land. Verse number 12 it says, and the land shall mourn every family apart and the, the family uh, of the house of David apart. Let's just take the uh, every family apart. We see uh, every family for itself. Uh, we know Christ traveled through the land of Israel and so the entire land will repent and will receive forgiveness. Christ's ministry will not remain barren. Uh, he, and uh, the, the verses that we had earlier in Zechariah, Zechariah 3, verse 9, this is where it says, I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. This is where that takes place. In one day, He removes the iniquity of the land. And, and here we see that it says, uh, the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. There's several things mentioned here. Every family for itself is mentioned in verse 12 and verse 14. Verse 14 says all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. Well, uh, verses 12 through 14 here emphasizes that no family is left out. Now, women and men will repent separately and lament just as Today, women and men are separated in the synagogues and at the Wailing Wall. Okay, they're separate. That's why I was talking about they're they're separate. Uh, when uh, we uh, the masses of Israel will repent when Christ returns to the earth. And he talks about the, not only every family for itself, but the family of David. Think about King David. King David sinned grievously against the Lord. And here we see the house of David will repent. And surely this is a pointer to Israel's political leadership. Of course, Jesus was part of the house of David. I mean, he came out of the house of David. And uh, they, 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 they need to be one of the early ones to repent, don't they? And they didn't even accept the one that came from their family. Now, the family of Nathan. And we know that Nathan was the prophet who had rebuked David after his fall into sin and led him back to God. Yet even this prophetic family will repent and that's a picture of the Old Testament prophets. He represents the prophets. Then you have the family of Levi, mentioned in verse 13. Uh, uh, Levi is the priestly tribe that served in the things of the temple. And from this tribe came the high priest who led the great day of atonement. And it was the religious authorities uh, who both persecuted and accused Christ Jesus and ultimately had him condemned to death through Pilate, they will also repent. Then you got the family of Shimei. Uh, well, Shimei came from the house of Saul. Uh, Shimei uh, cursed David when David was fleeing from his son Absalom. Uh, Shimei threw stones at David and his servants and called him a bloody man. You want to read about that? That's in 2 Samuel 16, verses 5 through 14. But what I want you to see is this family will also repent, indicating, I believe, the, the restoration of the house of Saul. This list of names represents all the various classes of the house of Israel, the whole Jewish population. Nobody 
is excluded. It, it says all the families that remain is what it says there. Uh, this, this points to Romans 11 and verse number 26 where we read, and, oh, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And that refers to the prophecy found in Isaiah 59, verse 20 and 21. That's Isaiah 59, verse 20 and 21. So, in conclusion here, here in this betrayal of repentance lies a deep, earnest truth. No person can repent for another. I can't repent for you. You can't repent for me. Uh, you can't repent for your for your uh, children's sake as much as you would like to. You'd like to, to be able to be saved for them, but you can't do it. they got to repent on their own. Um, everyone must come to God personally. God has no grandchildren. Without repentance from sin, uh, turning to Jesus Christ, there is no way into the kingdom of God. So everyone must repent personally and be converted. Whoever does not come to Christ with all its heart cannot be saved. And the question is, uh, you know, to make sure that you have uh, come to Christ, that you have repented personally and been converted to Christ with your heart. Amen? Well, that's chapter 12. We'll pick up chapter 13 that is also talking about the revelation of Messiah and the uh, setting up of His kingdom. That We will be reading about the kingdom and uh, what's going on there, uh, uh, Lord willing, next next Sunday evening. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we just thank you.